you most probably already know that EGA was one of the big successful PC video standards of the 1980s. Introduced in 1984 by IBM, the Enhanced Graphics Adapter was a 16 color standard that sat between their color graphics adapter, which they introduced in 1981, which displayed four colors out of a total 16, and their video graphics array, which they introduced in 1987, which had a total of 256 colors at any one time out of more than 262,000. But quick poll, did you click on this video because you wanted to know what Super EGA was? Or were you more curious about what Smart EGA is all about? Well, Smart EGA is just a brand name of a small graphics company, NSI Logic Inc., which traded out of these unassuming offices in the 1980s and the warehouse immediately behind. Smart stood for Single Monitor Adapter Technology, Something so generic it could have applied to almost any graphics card of the era. The interesting technology for the purposes of this video is the one that's mentioned right down in here. We'll have to turn to the high resolution photos to really see this. It says Super EGA Model 4850 High Res. This was introduced by Genoa in 1986. You see the chipset here, the GN006001A and 2A, and they were responsible for manufacturing this PCB, and they sold it, of course, to other OEMs like NSI Logic Inc. But when Super EGA was introduced to the public, for example, in this February 1987 InfoWorld article, it wasn't clear what it was. Genoa talked about it as a graphics card that will support PGA, EGA, CGA, MDA, Hercules, and even TGA cards. Uh, they do mention that it would have 640 by 480 pixel resolution, and they were planning to develop custom designs for vendors based on their Super EGA chips. NSI's Smart EGA actually managed to garner a review before this in October 1986, but the reviewers didn't seem to know what to make of it. They claimed that NSI had designed the chips themselves and didn't say very much except that it could emulate all the IBM video modes and Hercules, that it remembered its settings after a soft boot, that it had drivers for various pieces of software, for example Microsoft Flight Simulator, and that they couldn't recommend it because the company was very small and the card hadn't appeared in retail stores yet. Now, NSI did actually manage to produce their own VLSI chip and graphics card. The chip was the EVC315 and the card was the NSI Smart EGA Plus. One can only presume that the Smart EGA used the Genoa chip Although it's interesting to note that the photograph of the card doesn't actually match the one that I have. Of course, apart from the Smart EGA label, it does match exactly the board that's shown in this Genoa Super EGA advertisement. So, who knows who the vendor was? We do know that it is an NSI Smart EGA BIOS, and that it is a Genoa 4850 Super EGA card. So, what is Super EGA anyway? For that, we should have to go no further than the advertisement from Genoa themselves from February 1987. The main feature appears to have been hardware emulation of graphics modes, 100% compatibility with EGA, CGA, MDA, Hercules, the TrueVision graphics adapter, better known as Targa, and the professional graphics adapter from IBM. The resolution was higher than ordinary EGA, up to 64480, or with their high-res model, 800x600, and in text modes there was an effective resolution of up to 1056x352 pixels. So now we know that this thing is a high-resolution EGA card, and given that it's the high-res model, we know that it supports up to 800x600 pixels in graphics mode. But what about the super drivers that Genoa refers to in their advertising? Well, the Genoa Systems website hasn't been around for a very long time. We have to access it through the Wayback Machine. Their video card driver section does have a driver for the 4000 series EGA cards, but this file was not archived and I spent many hours looking for it somewhere else on the web. It seems to have been lost to history. But, even if we could find the drivers, there's something else that we'd need, which is also very rare today. 
an EGA multi-sync monitor. You see, these cards were used in a professional environment for CAD, CAM and so on, and the multi-sync that we're talking about is not the later and much more common VGA multi-sync, which actually used a completely different connector and video signal, but the much earlier and rarer multi-sync EGA, which I've never seen personally. Technically, the original IBM EGA monitor, the 5154, was some kind of multi-sync EGA, but it only supported two modes, which in this video I'm going to refer to as Mode 1 EGA and Mode 2 EGA, which is what they were called in the IBM documentation. Mode 1 EGA was for compatibility with CGA. It had 200 displayed scan lines in the vertical direction and a horizontal sync pulse of 15.7 kHz. But Mode 2 EGA was a higher resolution. It had 350 displayed scan lines in the vertical direction and a horizontal sync of 21.85 kHz. Now you might wonder how the monitor knew which mode it should be in. And for this, IBM had an ingenious solution. When plugged into an EGA card, the polarity of the vertical sync pulse was inverted, so the monitor knew that it should be in mode 2. But when plugged into an ordinary CGA card, the sync pulse was just normal, and so the monitor knew that it should use mode 1. Now it's important not to get mode 1 and mode 2 in this context mixed up with BIOS video modes. Mode here refers to modes of the monitor. There were multiple BIOS video modes that worked with each of the two resolutions that the monitor could support. And other multi-sync EGA monitors that came later supported many other resolutions. Fortunately, this card also supports a standard EGA monitor for resolutions up to 640x350, Mode 2 EGA, and also Mode 1 EGA, like the original IBM EGA card, which can actually even run on a CGA monitor with a resolution of 320x200. But before we try these out, something else caught my eye. This Dutch article from the 1988 Radio Bulletin mentions a Genoa Smart EGA 800x600. But wait a minute, didn't we establish that Smart EGA is a trademark of NSI? And on the next page, they list out the Genoa 800x600 Smart EGA extended modes. The first two, P1 and P2, they refer to as Plantronics modes. And initially, I just assumed they'd got this mixed up with the Professional Graphics Adapter, which sometimes has the abbreviation PGA, just like the Plantronics Graphics Adapter. But in the text, you can see that they understand PGA is 640x480, whereas here we have 320x200 16 color and 640x200 4 color modes, which run on a CGA monitor. Plantronics indeed. So do we have a Genoa Super EGA board and chipset with an NSI Smart EGA BIOS? Or do we have a Genoa 800x600 Smart EGA board? This is a mystery well worth solving. The Plantronics Color Plus is a graphics card that was released in 1982, two years before EGA, that was 100% CGA compatible, but could display 16 colors. Now if you look close at the image, you can see that it's two boards stuck together, and this makes perfect sense, since it had twice as much memory as a CGA card, used the same graphics controller chip, the MC6845, and of course, one way of doing all of this would be to have one graphics card to control two of the bits of color information, and a second almost identical card to control the other two bits. Now unfortunately the only known game to support the Plantronics 16 color mode is the Planet X3 game by the 8-bit guy. It was ported to the Plantronics Color Plus by Benedict Fryson. And I wonder if our graphics card supports these modes. If it did, that would be amazing because as far as I know, this is not known. Now in order to try and get to the bottom of this, I had a look overnight for software which can use the Plantronics modes. And I discovered that CompuShow can actually display images in the 16 color Plantronics mode. But as you can see, something's not quite right here. There's immediately some blue garbage on the screen. Then it starts displaying the image, but only with the red and green information. 
Now the way the 16 color Plantronics mode works is that the ordinary CGA memory contains the red and green bits and immediately following that is another plane that contains the blue and intensity bits. So it's clearly that second plane which is not working and I didn't know whether it was CompuShow or the graphics card itself that was at fault. So I decided to write my own code to display in the 16 color mode and I got exactly the same result. But then I realized in Plantronics 16 color mode, you can actually switch the planes around so that the second plane appears in the CGA memory. So what I did is I filled the information in for one of the planes, switched the planes over, then filled in the other plane, and let me show you the results. This is just a simple pattern that I put in the two planes so that we can see all the Plantronics colors. And as you can see, it seems to be working perfectly. So basically this card does support the Plantronics 16 color mode. It just doesn't allow access to the second plane at memory locations immediately following the CJ memory. But uh, we can work with this. In particular, this is so similar to the way CGA is, it even has the two 8K banks, that what I can do is take some software that I've written for CGA and modify it to work in Plantronics mode. And this is what I came up with. It's the rotating icosahedron, which I've shown on the channel previously. But before displaying it, I go into the second plane, which is responsible for the blue and intensity bits, and I set up that checker pattern you see in the background. Then I switch back to the first plane and just treat it like a normal CGA card, and this is the result. So yes, I can confirm this card does support the 16 color Plantronics mode. Now you could do something similar with CGA. You could change the palette a few times in the vertical direction, but unfortunately it's near on impossible to change the palette smoothly in the horizontal direction. So you couldn't get exactly this effect. And moreover, you couldn't do this with EGA very easily either. It has four planes and you could do it, but you'd have to rewrite the code entirely from scratch. And that would be a lot of work. This only took me half an hour. So it's really cool to be able to try something like this out. So what more can be said about the link between NSI Logic's Smart EGA and Genoa's Smart EGA? Well, as you can see, when I boot the card, it says Genoa Super EGA BIOS. And yet this is the BIOS that has Smart EGA written on it. So I have a little bit more information and then some speculation. It turns out that the NSA Logic Company was started by an Indian founder and there's no information about the company in the computing magazines after about the end of 1987. There's a little bit about what they intended to do but I can't find any evidence that they actually did it. And it turns out that the company was actually wound up by its investors they didn't want to back such a small company going head to head with IBM in the CAD CAM market. So the company was sold off along with its assets. My speculation is that Genoa may have purchased the trademark Smart EGA or perhaps even the entire company. We may never know, but uh, it's an interesting story. The founder of NSI Logic eventually received an entrepreneurship award from no less than Ronald Reagan himself. So it may be that there's no link whatsoever between the NSI Logic Smart EGA cards, which probably did use their own chips after all, and this card, which used the Genoa chips. Or it may be just a trademark that was moved over. Or maybe there's actually some code from the BIOS that's used in this card that was in the original NSI Logic Smart EGA. Well, Genoa continued to exist and they claimed 100% CGA compatibility. So I'm running Jim Leonard's CGA compatibility tester. And first of all, we're going to check the memory read speed. And yeah, it says 259 kilobytes per second, which is actually slower than an original IBM CGA, which gets 291. The write speed's also slower at 259 instead of 340. As you might expect, the border or overscan region works just fine. The background color can be changed without any problems. In the high resolution mode, the foreground color can be changed. Let's check out if all the palettes are there. The two magenta ones are there, the two red ones are there, and yeah, there's cyan, red, and white. In the 80 by 25 text mode, there's no snow. 
And we might have expected this because they actually use DRAM chips on this board rather than SRAM. So it's interesting that they've gone to the trouble to implement snow suppression that actually works here. And very surprisingly, raster bars actually work on this. That was not expected. Uh, I had expected there to be some kind of incompatibility in the CJ register set, but uh, this is actually working just fine. And this really fancy row reprogramming trick even works. And here's Vilar's very famous graphic, and yeah, that's coming up perfectly, so this is really a great card. Well, maybe I spoke a little bit too soon. The border overscan region is supposed to be visible. I think that's what it says. A bit hard to say because this technique is not working. So it looks like it's not 100% compatible. The display positioning seems to work okay. I'm not sure what's up with start address reprogramming. This also seems to not be 100% compatible. I don't think that this is supposed to scroll and then display those vertical bars. The horizontal scrolling seems to work okay though. Well, according to their documentation, it's 100% compatible with CGA. I would differ with that, but it is a pretty good implementation of CGA if a little bit slow. Now this video wouldn't be complete unless I showed some EGA graphics. And so I'm just running the EGA load program that I wrote for the recent video on dithering on the channel. So this is a 16 color EGA graphic in so-called mode one EGA. Now the mode here doesn't refer to the graphics mode, but the mode of the monitor itself. This is a CGA monitor, so it can only support mode 1 EGA, which has 200 scan lines vertically. But mode 2 EGA has 350 scan lines vertically, and for that you need a genuine EGA monitor. So I'm going to take the EGA monitor off my Amstrad PC1640 and hook it up, and then write some code to display some higher resolution EGA graphics. And after a bit of effort, I managed to convert my EGA load program to mode 2 EGA. So it'll take a while to load this file. It's a large file, 112,000 bytes, and it'll load each bit plane separately. So this is EGA mode 10H, which is certainly mode 2 EGA, and it's 640 by 350 resolution, so much higher. And the image is of the inside of a hot air balloon, which I found online. It's an almost public domain image. Credits are in the description, and I've converted it to EGA using the Dithertron, which uses Floyd Steinberg dithering to make it look more realistic given the very limited color palette. But I think the result looks really great, and this EGA card's handling it just fine. It's just a shame that I don't have a multi sync EGA monitor to show you the even higher resolutions that this EGA card would be capable of. To finish off today, I want to show you a viewer suggestion. It's a game called Loom, which was suggested as a great demonstration of how dithering can be used in EGA to great effect. The artist here is Mark Ferrari, and there's actually a link in the description to a really great GDC talk he gave about his technique, showing off a lot of his artwork. It's really amazing stuff, and I highly recommend taking a look. Interestingly enough, the graphics card put my EGA monitor out of sync when doing this, so I'm back to the CJ monitor, but this is still 16 colors, obviously. This is the demo of the game. I believe this was shown at CES, and it was really revolutionary when it appeared. Uh, obviously, games before this hadn't used much in the way of dithering because dithering didn't compress at that time but uh, they eventually figured out how to do this, and the results, uh, well, they just speak for themselves. A lot of people didn't realize that the game was EGA when they first saw it. Well, I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this look at my very unusual Super EGA card. If you have any comments about this or know any additional history on this, then leave it below. Uh, anyway, thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in a later video. Bye.